Our presenter today is Mark Madison. He's the National Historian for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and he's in charge of the agency's Heritage and Partnership Branch. There he conducts educational outreach efforts, he designs museum displays, and he helps maintain some half a million different items uh, in their library and archives. It's called the National Conservation Training Center Archives and Museum, and it's located in Shepherdstown, West Virginia. Uh, he also teaches or has taught environmental history, environmental ethics, and environmental film at Shepherd University. Before joining the service, he taught the history of science at Harvard University and also at the University of Melbourne, and he spent three years as a Peace Corps volunteer in the Philippines. Now, in today's presentation, Mark will discuss this unique archive and museum and the challenges and opportunities therein. And with that, I'm going to turn things over to Mark. Thanks, Jamie. Appreciate it. And I really want to thank all of you participants, uh, many of whom uh, I already know. It's so nice to see so many of my friends from uh, various friends groups or my ASEH friends uh, since we haven't had a conference in a couple of years. It's, it's great to see you guys, if at least virtually. Uh, as you can see, I'm broadcasting from an office that looks suspiciously like my home. Uh, I've had both decorated the same way, so nobody can tell. But seriously, I am at home. Uh, thanks to COVID, like many of you, uh, but I did go into the office earlier this week uh, so I could show you a little bit about where I work. So um, what I think I do is uh, jump in just a second to the first video. It's only about two minutes long, and I'm going to show you uh, our archival space where we put together museum displays, where we accession artifacts, sometimes freeze them if we're worried about insects or, or uh, mildew or mold and so on. This is just about two minutes uh, and I will talk over this video because it's, uh, it's silent. And then after that, I'll show you our museum. So I'll try to do more showing than telling uh, to the best of my ability. So let me share my screen. Okay. Hopefully people can see uh, the archive right now. Uh, and I'm going to run a little video and um, talk over it. It's just about two minutes showing you the archive. So, uh, so this is our archive at National Conservation Training Center in Shepherdstown, West Virginia. This is where uh, my staff works, uh, where items come in. As you can see, it's a bit of an odd archive. We get everything from grizzly bears um, to behind it is a very interesting polar bear pelt. Uh, that polar bear pelt uh, was from the first expedition in the North Pole. That's some original Native American art on salmon for a new display we're doing on the history of Native Americans. Um, we also have some display rooms uh, where we bring in courses and so on to show them some of our objects in a secure location. And I thought I'd just show you a few of these objects that are some of my favorites. My apologies for the roller coaster Blair Witch film work here. <laughs> uh, this is also in our Native American display. This is carved out of uh, bison uh, bone and it was done by a Native American artist. We're talking about restoration of different wildlife. This is our oldest item. It's a 10,000 year old elk antler from one of our refuges in upstate New York. Um, so that's kind of a fun artifact. This is a branding iron used by one of our classic refuges, Wichita Mountains Refuge, where some of the first bison restoration occurred. We use this to brand horses. This is, we'll see a, in a little bit, this was used on train cars that transported fish across the nation. This is a custard cup from the U.S. Bureau of Fisheries. Uh, this is from the Civilian Conservation Corps in the 1930s. Uh, an ashtray out of our refuge symbol, the blue goose, uh, kind of prof profane use of that. And this is our most valuable, at least monetarily, artifact. This was given to us by the Sultan of Qatar. Well, it was actually given to President George W. Bush. Uh, this is Rachel Carson's magnifying glass. She worked for us for 16 years uh, as an editor and a scientist. Uh, so we're very happy to have this. This is uh, a pair 
uh, tattoo kit. Uh, and if the bears wake up too early, you close it quickly and run as fast as you can, hence the mess. And this is a 1950s uh, radiation detector that was sent out to refuges in the midst of the Cold War uh, so they could report back to DC uh, when the country was no longer radioactive. And I just wanted to give you a sense of some of the raw material in the archives, what the archives um, looks like. And then I'll get rid of the stopping share. Hopefully you guys were able to, to hear that. Um, so I wanted to start with, since our name is Fish and Wildlife Service Archives and Museum, uh, we have an archives, we have about half a million items, as Jamie nicely mentioned, um, and uh, we also have a museum. And we have a quick question about uh, why did we obtain that piece from Cutter? Uh, good question. Uh, we ran by it pretty quick, but the hilt of that uh, sword or dagger was made out of elephant ivory. So even though it was given to the president, President George W. Bush, who accepted it, uh, things that have illegal wildlife parts end up in our archive because um, we don't want to put them on display in presidential libraries and encourage other people um, to kill elephants to make uh, ceremonial daggers. So went down that rabbit trail, promised I wouldn't answer questions till the end, but I lied. Uh, so we've shown you that. Now I'd like to show you the museum. The museum is kind of interesting because it's still under construction, as you're going to see. Uh, we, we took advantage of COVID to redo all our displays and try to maybe update a little, put more objects on display than we had previously. So I'm going to give you a little tour uh, of our museum. Once again, uh, courtesy of Shaky Cam, I tried to hold uh, my phone as best I could. Uh, and We'll show you the museum. This one should have narration if I can get it all to work properly. Uh, and this one's about 10 minutes long. So uh, let me try another share screen after I open this up. This is uh, the beginning of our renovated museum and it's an interactive map showing the growth of the refuge system and the national fish hatchery system. Every decade, uh, you'll see the number of dots increase as our agency has grown in our public land responsibilities over the last 150 years. So as part of the sesquicentennial, we renovated our NCTC museum and it opens uh, with this collection uh, of some of our 100,000 historic still images. These are all pictures of our employees in the past carrying out our evolving Fish and Wildlife Service mission. And as we enter the museum, we tell a little story about the American Conservation Movement. The first thing you see is part of a diorama in progress, recreating one of our bird banding cabins uh, in northern Canada where flyway biologists would overnight. And then when they stayed here, they actually carved their name into this actual door uh, that was sent to us from the original cabin. And then the first of our newly renovated displays is here. It shows North American efforts to understand its wildlife, uh, the abuse and overuse of wildlife from 1800 uh, to 1900 or so, and then some early attempts to protect America's wildlife uh, with the beginning of bird refuges, kind of the origin point for what became the National Wildlife Refuge System. We also have a series of five large murals uh, that tell a more detailed story of the American conservation movement. And below them is something really new here. Uh, these are all going to be temporary museum displays that will change every month that will allow us to show more of the half million objects or so uh, that we house in the Fish and Wildlife Service archives. So our agency began 150 years ago in 1871 with fisheries. The origin point for our agency was the U.S. Fish Commission and its job was to restore fish across North America, both marine and freshwater fish. And in this diorama you see some of the tools that they used. Uh, initially fish were transported in milk jugs, later in these uh, pails next to the milk jug called furno pails. Uh, they were moved on the rails and we have some Interesting artifacts from that, from the train era. Uh, these rail car journeys could take 
uh, weeks to go from the East Coast to the West Coast, and they had a full crew, including a cook, and they used this China pictured here, which has the fisheries flag on it, uh, as they lived on these uh, so-called fish cars uh, for weeks at a time. They would eat on them, and this is the China that they would use. The next display case attempts to, to show really a pivot point for our agency in the 1930s. Uh, when a lot of things changed because of the Depression and the Dust Bowl. This is a recreation of a Civilian Conservation Corps camp. Uh, in this case, it was an African-American CCC camp, which we had uh, across the nation, including White River Refuge in Arkansas. Uh, these are some of the tools the CCC would have used, including cross-cut saws, uh, small shovels, uh, a little CCC license plate, and so on. Uh, and then on the pedestal, we have an original drawing uh, by J. Ding Darling, uh, who was head of our agency during the height of the New Deal from 1934 to 1935. And this is a little poster he drew uh, promoting uh, the New Deal work by the CCC and others at Upper Soros Migratory Waterfowl Refuge. The next diorama attempts to take you back to 1903 with the beginning of the National Wildlife Refuge System. It started at Pelican Island, Florida, uh, and its first and only employee was Paul Craigle, uh, pictured on the mural here, kind of petting uh, a pelican. Now, Paul Craigle, when he was hired, was only paid a dollar a month, so he had to supplement his income by this sign. This is an original sign Craigle made. Uh, taking people on tours of Pelican Island uh, for $2 a boatload. Uh, so that was how he supplemented his income. He was also a boat builder, so he built the boats uh, that he took people out uh, to see the refuge. Uh, the first sign he put up on the refuge was a large sign that said, U.S. Reservation, keep off. Unfortunately, that sign scared the Pelicans, uh, so he had to take it down a year later. Next to that, we have his uniform, which is not really a uniform. Uh, all we had in that period was, was a badge, basically. Uh, so he wore his regular clothes, including a, a sweater and a fedora. And he scared poachers away from the island uh, with his firearm, which is next to him. It's a 10-gauge double-barreled shotgun that he would use to shoot uh, in front of the bows of, of boats that were carrying poachers that were out to decimate the pelicans. And on the pedestal in front, we actually have the executive order that Theodore Roosevelt used um, to create Pelican Island in 1903 and the appointment papers uh, when Craigle was hired. It's kind of hard to believe, but the National Wildlife Refuge System began with one four acre island uh, on the Atlantic coast of Florida and now has grown to over 560 refuges on 150 million acres. And then this next display is a recreation of Rachel Carson's office. Rachel Carson is easily our most famous employee. Uh, she worked for us from 1936 to 1952. She did everything from write radio scripts to doing press releases to doing pamphlets promoting the refuge system. Uh, this is one of the typewriters that she used while she worked at Chincoteague National Wildlife Refuge. And in it is the very first press release she wrote on DDT way back in 1945, warning of the dangers of this new pesticide. We also have some personal memorabilia. We actually house uh, the Rachel Carson Council collection. Uh, so we have a photo of her uh, as a field hockey player when she was at Chatham College, uh, reminding us Carson was not only a scientist, she was also a jock. Uh, and then something I really love that we got from the Rachel Carson Council is a letter from the great doctor, scientist, humanitarian Albert Schweitzer uh, to Rachel Carson. Carson had dedicated her famous book Silent Spring to Albert Schweitzer, and he wrote her a letter in French of appreciation. And we have the original of that in the archives. Carson's work uh, in Silent Spring uh, promoted the dangers of DDT and also advocated for the creation of an endangered species program to try to restore wildlife that had been decimated by pesticides and other toxins. And what we have in this display is a recreation of some of those wildlife restoration efforts. 
uh, the costume and the baby whooping crane chick uh, remind us that Patuxent Research Refuge in Laurel, Maryland uh, was an area where the captive breeding of whooping cranes was very successful, allowing this bird, which had been decimated by DDT, to be restored across North America. And above that is one of my favorite artifacts in the museum. It's a black-footed ferret uh, nicknamed Lucille. Uh, uh, black-footed ferrets were declared extinct in the 1970s, and Lucille, this very ferret, uh, on the shelf here was rediscovered in 1981 by a rancher's dog and unfortunately killed. Uh, a small pack of black-footed ferrets were then found and uh, brought back at various captive breeding facilities. And now black-footed ferrets have been reintroduced at a number of sites uh, in the American West and they're doing very well, brought back from the brink of extinction. Then as we move through the rest of the museum, there's just a couple smaller displays. This goes back to our history of law enforcement. Uh, John Perry's uh, uniform is portrayed on the left here, on the right here, excuse me. Uh, he was a very dapper 1920s law enforcement agent. And then he would wear the costume on the left and dress up like a hobo uh, and try to infiltrate various bootlegging and duck legging organizations in Chicago uh, by going undercover. His operations might have been some of the very first federal undercover investigations ever to be carried out in the country. And then behind these mannequins is Ding Darling's printing press. We brought this up all the way from Iowa. Uh, it weighs 6,000 pounds and Darling used this uh, to make copies of the, the various wildlife artwork he produced throughout his lifetime. The most famous bit of artwork he produced, of which we have an etching, uh, is the original duck stamp, which he drew in 1934 and helped us acquire uh, many millions of acres of waterfowl habitat ever since. And then as we head out of the museum, there's just a couple more objects that are perennial favorites here. Uh, we have about a six foot narwhal tusk. This is one of the uh, items that our law enforcement personnel have confiscated after being smuggled illegally into the country. Uh, it's interesting, it's actually a tooth uh, from this aquatic uh, whale and it is the source of the unicorn myth. Uh, many narwhal tusks were sent back to Europe uh, many hundreds of years ago and displayed in curio cabinets as unicorn horn. And then another Arctic species neighboring the narwhal is the polar bear. Uh, the largest taxidermed uh, specimen we have in the museum. Uh, it's over seven foot tall. And the polar bear is historic because it was the very first species to be declared endangered uh, based on global climate change. And then finally, as we reach the end of the museum, uh, the favorite artifact from visitors to the museum is the Murray cabin. This is an almost pitch perfect recreation of the cabin of Olaus and Marty Murray in Jackson, Wyoming. Olaus uh, was a mammologist who worked for us from 1919 uh, to 1945, one of the great chroniclers of elk, one of the great illustrators for our agency, and one of the founders of the Wilderness Society. He lived there with his wife, Marty. Uh, who was a great natural history writer uh, and also a fierce wilderness advocate who lived to be over a hundred uh, in this cabin, which looks like an oversized dollhouse, but really is an homage to their uh, century of conservation work uh, is easily the most popular thing in our museum. And then as we finish the museum tour, we wanted to remind our visitors that even though the missions changed a lot, our tools have changed a lot, our uniforms have changed a lot, we're still carrying on that mission today. And the final display on the outside of the museum shows our contemporary Fish and Wildlife Service employees continuing to carry out our mission of protecting America's fish and wildlife resources. So that was just a, a quickie uh, video tour of the archives and then uh, a little more finished product uh, in the museum. 
but I thought it might be more interesting uh, than a PowerPoint or just looking at my head <laughs> talking to you uh, and give you at least a sense. We still have a ways to go. I still have an empty display case to fill up, um, but it's uh, it's been really fun and we've tried to take use of, of this COVID interruption and, and having usually about 15,000 students a year at the National Conservation Training Center uh, to upgrade our exhibits and update them to a certain extent. Just a couple other notes before I get to what I'm really interested in is the questions. Um, we also have a historic image library with about 100,000 still images. We have a historic book collection, including uh, those of you from ASEH, uh, or anybody in the environmental uh, history or history of science field to recognize this, Carolyn Merchant's book collection, which is extensive. We have Rachel Carson's personal library, which is interesting and informative. Who knew Rachel Carson liked reading books about cats? That was new to us. Um, and uh, we also have a training mission. Uh, we kind of function like a little conservation campus. And, and in normal years, when we're not in the midst of a pandemic, I said about 15,000 students come through there. So our museum is in part set up for the students that come out there, for our own employees and the Fish and Wildlife Service and the Department of Interior uh, that might come out there. Uh, and we've had uh, the great fortune, just like FHS, we have a public lecture series um, and we've been very fortunate in the past to have a lot of conservation historians come out here. Kurt Miney was actually our first public lecture out here, the Aldo Leopold biographer, Mark Harvey, uh, the Howard Zahnheiser biographer has been out here. Um, so we, we try to do outreach uh, in addition uh, to the work we do internally with our students and with our guests. So I've been talking way too much. Uh, I've shown you some of our archives and museum. Uh, we have a number of distinguished panelists here, uh, including some ringers. Uh, and then we also have some panelists with me, including Eben uh, and Lauren. And, and uh, so I think it'd be a great time to take any questions you might have. And if they're too hard, then I'm gonna pretend like I lost my connection and disconnect. <laughs> It's a virtue I have uh, when we're doing distance learning and not in person. Now we'll we'll try to answer any questions you might have. Thanks, Mark. Those videos were great, and um, somebody commented. It looks like uh, somebody commented about we can't wait to till we can all come and be there in person to see it. Um, I've been there to the training center. It's been several years ago, and the campus is beautiful and a great place for. Um, for training, but also meetings. And um, the uh, what I uh, was really interested to see is how you've taken advantage of the opportunity that, that, you know, without the public coming through your museum to really rethink and reorganize and, and kind of, I guess, redo the exhibit space. Um, some obvious upgrades using video screens and things like that. So I'm, I'm excited to be able to come back and see the, the upgrades. I, I recognize the polar bear towards the end. <laughs> yep. He's a great photo op. Um, if you're ever there, the selfie opportunity. I've got one of me just standing there st going like this in front <laughs> with, with the bear coming in behind me. So if nothing else, you have to go and uh, take some selfies there with the polar bear. But uh, we do have some questions. I'm gonna go ahead and ask Lauren and Evan to come on. Um, and, and weigh in when, when appropriate. And, and folks, I do want to remind you that you're welcome to ask questions of, about both FHS and uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service. And so Ellen Anderson asks right out of the gates, um, she's always wondered why it's fish and wildlife rather than just the wildlife service. She wants to know, are fish not considered to be wildlife as well? So Mark, that's for you. That's a really hard question. I think we'll we'll pass that over to FHS. <laughs> no, um, uh, before I answer that really quickly, somebody just asked quickly in the chat where we are. We're in Shepherdstown, West Virginia. We're about 70 miles west of DC, something I should have mentioned before. So we're near historic Harper's Ferry, kind of in a, a wooded campus on the Potomac River. Fish and Wildlife Service, yeah, it's a really weird name. It's, it's kind of a redundant name. Uh, and it's, it's a historic artifact. 
like everything else I showed you. Uh, we began 150 years ago. So this is our sesquicentennial, a fun word I rarely get to say. And uh, we began as the US Commission of Fish and Fisheries, which evolved into a Bureau of Fisheries, charge of everything that, that lives in water, basically from mussels to freshwater and saltwater species. And then there was a parallel agency you might've heard of called the Bureau of Biological Survey that was basically in charge of any species that wasn't aquatic birds, mammals, insects, and so on. There were two separate agencies um, that were combined in 1940. Uh, and, and so the two bureaus, Biological Survey and the Bureau of Fisheries became Fish and Wildlife Service. And uh, in part, it was so the Bureau of Fisheries, the older of the two bureaus, didn't completely lose its identity, uh, even though fish is clearly a type of wildlife. Um, and also uh, some universities, particularly land-grant universities, uh, sometimes there is a distinction in academic programs between those who study fisheries and those who might study, uh, thanks to Aldo Leopold, wildlife management and so on. So there was, it was not seen as anachronistic in 1940 when the name was coined, although now it does seem very redundant. So our, our very name uh, is a historic relic, which is kind of cool. Thanks for that question. And Ellen Murphy wants to know why were people shooting pelicans in such large numbers? <laughs> Ellen Murphy is a ringer. <laughs> to tell you now, um, she is one of our most valued uh, volunteers in our archives. And, and because we only have a few staff, we're utterly dependent uh, on highly expert volunteers like Ellen. But she brings up a good question. Why were people shooting pelicans? People shooting pelicans at Pelican Island actually goes back to Audubon. Audubon went down there, John James Audubon, to shoot pelicans so he could depict them in his birds of North America. So Pelican Island had a long history as a place where you went if you wanted to shoot pelicans. Um, primarily, uh, they were being shot uh, around 1903. Their, their feathers were used for quill pens, uh, a type of industry we don't think of much today. Uh, they were also sometimes shot uh, by fishermen because uh, they were seen as competing with, with fishing, although they don't really eat the same type of fish fishermen were uh, going after. Uh, and then sometimes they were just shot for sport. It was common um, for boaters to take people out there just so they could shoot these pelicans. The pelicans would sit on this little four-acre island as the boat approached, they would start to fly away or they'd sit there till you shot the first one and it was just seen as sporting at the time. So uh, there was a variety of reasons. They were not shot uh, for women's fashion which really pressured the other birds on the island. Things like uh, roseate spoonbills, egrets, and so on. Those were used for women's fashion, and they were decimated in Florida uh, for that industry. But pelicans were used for quill pens and, and sport primarily, although it wasn't very sporting. Does not sound like it was. <laughs> no. We're going to combine two questions, uh, one from Jane Carruthers and the other from Becky Fullerton. Um, Jane wants to know if you could outline the organizing principles of the manuscript collection. Becky wants to know what determines the type of archive material you accession uh, at your facility as opposed to materials going to the National Archives. Those are really good questions. Yeah, yeah it, so it sounds like they're asking about our scope of collection primarily. Um, so yeah, we're, we're a federal archive. Um, permanent records, which to put it to oversimplify it, largely records coming out of our headquarters regarding major decisions and so on, those all go to the National Archives as they should from a federal agency. Our collection tends to be uh, more in the nature of field notes, personal notes, um, films and images, which we also share with the National Archives. Often we have multiple copies of them. Uh, things that are uh, temporary research collections more so than the permanent collection. So if you wanted to see uh, Ding Darling's letters lobbying um, Congress to create the first duck stamp in 1934, that would be in the National Archives in all likelihood when he was uh, head of the biological survey. Um, but other things that the National Archive doesn't collect um, like uh, some of his artwork, the printing press, and so on, or things that were in his personal family possession, um, they come to our archive. So we have pretty decent collections of many of our former uh, employees, um, from the, you know, Murray's to, to some items from Rachel Carson and, and folks like that. 
but the the things that were done by the head of our agency while they were the head of our agency, those should all be in the National Archives. And, and we help with the, uh, the record schedule and getting stuff there. So Evan, I'll pose the same questions to you and to, to Lauren, if you could talk about uh, what the Forest History Society accessions and what we don't accession. Sure, yeah, we're a little bit different in that we don't have a dedicated, you know, full on museum space. Um, in our new building, we have a few glass cases, but we're not, you know, we don't have a primary museum component of what we're doing. Um, most of what we take on for our archives is, is paper documents um, and then also photographs, films, that kind of thing. But not a lot of the three-dimensional objects that you get with the, the bears and the, the goose ashtrays and that kind of stuff. We do have a smoky bear costume, an old smoky bear costume and a few other um, kind of one-off items that are part of larger collections that we take on, but we, we, we tend to focus more on the documents um, than the like museum three-dimensional items. And Lauren, from your perspective as the librarian, can you talk a little bit about what FHS uh, takes on? Yeah, I mean, I can speak for the books as the person who <laughs> brings the books in. Um, yeah, we basically are interested in all books related to environmental history, you know, specifically forest history, um, but, you know, we, we will take that kind of broader environmental history um, um, books as well. Uh, we get, we have a lot of just like general historical books, textbooks on forest history. Um, and then we also take on like new publications um, that have to do with environmental history as well. And follow up on what Lauren was, was saying that, yeah, it's in our name, forest history, but um, it's not just about the trees, it's about the landscapes, forested landscapes and what happens on those. So it's water, watersheds, wildlife, fisheries, all of that. Um, basically, the way I describe it to, to friends is, whether there's a tree there or not, we're interested because trees, trees and forests will have some impact on that, that bit of land, uh, whether we're talking about the, the Southwest or the Pacific Northwest. Um, and I've, I'll also note that we have the US Forest Service History Reference Collection. And these are materials that uh, National Archives are not interested in. We take those on. Mm -hmm. But we also have the records of uh, lumber and logging companies, forest products companies, just any, anything doing with forests and forested landscapes in that way. So we do cast a much wider net than for obvious reasons what uh, Mark deals with there since he is agency specific. Um, <clears throat> Susan Wall asks if, uh, and I know Mark had, had mentioned this, but I want him to follow up on whether his archives contain historical photographs and if there's an online searchable uh, catalog for those photographs. Yeah, this is, and this was also asked by Ellen Stroud if we had finding aids. We do have some finding aids, they are not online yet. Uh, we're in the process of upgrading, hopefully this year, our digital asset management system, which we call the National Digital Library. Um, and that's where we primarily put our historic photos and so on, but we can't put 100,000 of them up there. We haven't scanned them all. Um, so we do have a list of all our images. We have a list of all the films we have. Um, when it comes to the paper documents, uh, they tend not to be uh, archived in as great a detail. A lot of them are still listed just as collections, just because we, until recently, had a staff of two, basically. Um, so we're working on those. Uh, but we're trying to put the most requested items online in this digital asset management system, um, which is uh, called the you know, USFWS uh, National Digital Library. And, and so we're working on it, but it's, you know, we're, we're a relatively new archive and we just have an NA staff. That's my excuse. <laughs> we're hoping to do it. Uh, one other thing, when we were talking about collections, um, I should mention, 
you know, when I came to work for Fish and Wildlife Service, um, I thought I would just stay a couple of years. I'd always been a professor. I really liked teaching. Um, and, and that was 21 years ago. Uh, and, and one of the things that, that made me want to stay, besides really liking the mission, it's hard not to like a mission protecting wildlife. You have to be kind of a misanthrope to, to not want to do that, um, was the diversity of the collection. So all my research as a PhD student had been in like the National Archives or, or University Archives. And suddenly there was an archive where we'd have, you know, uh, the first polar bear uh, shot on the first expedition to reach the North Pole. Uh, and that's kind of interesting it, to add some value to it. But what's even more interesting is it was shot by an African-American, um, a guy named Matt Henson, who was quite the Arctic and Antarctic explorer, um, but kind of written out of the history and, and kind of left out of it, just like the, uh, the Inuits that, that helped uh, that expedition reach the North Pole. And I, and I really like the diversity of items there. I like bear tattoo kits and wondering why it looks like such a mess. And he's like, well, the bear sometimes woke up early and you were tattooing their lips and, and then you ran like hell and locked yourself in the truck. Um, so I, I found it very exciting to have, first of all, a new archive. It didn't exist till 1997. Uh, and then to have this mix of items that, that kind of tell the story. So we have, you know, the records of the California condor, but we have one of the, uh, you know, it, it, I think it was 17, I can't remember the number exactly, uh, condors that were left in the wild before they were all taken to the Los Angeles and San Diego Zoo. And I, I just think that's really fun. It helps bring the history alive and, and um, that's why I stayed there. <laughs> I always find stuff, every drawer I open, um, we find cool new things. And, and that's kind of why I wanted to show you a video. I just think it, um, and, and I wish you can all visit at some point. I just think it uh, helps the history come alive. And, you know, we're such a visual field. We all do environmental history. That's really our background. And, and um, it's, it's a great field. It's really fun to open up Rachel Carson's library. And you know what's in every one of her books? A book plate. <laughs> this is from the library of Rachel Carson. She's just as anal as me who used to, to, to stamp his book so they came back. And then she's got a card catalog uh, descriptor in each one. And it, it just tells you a little something, something about Rachel Carson, uh, about how she functioned, how she researched that you might not know uh, without holding you know, her objects in, in your hands and so on. So that's that's part of the fun of our archives. And we, I think we tend to forget, or some of us tend to forget that these were humans. I mean, we, they've been elevated to this status. You know, if, you, if you're putting together a Mount Rushmore of important figures in environmental history, somebody like Rachel Carson is definitely in the, in the conversation. And so they tend to get elevated out of the realm of the human. Um, and then you, if you read about her, you realize that she was incredibly human. Um, and so, but I want to go back to the, the question about the <clears throat> photo archives and ask Evan and Lauren to talk a little bit about um, our film and film print and video collections here. And actually to touch on uh, some of the challenges of preserving especially film and video, that uh, our, our archives, and then Mark, I'll ask you to, to chime in as well about the, the challenges of these different formats. Yeah, well, um, just to back up a second, the most of the digitization work that we've done and have been doing for, I guess, over 15 years now has been focused on our photograph collection. Um, we also have a huge amount of historic photos. If you take together everything across all of our collections, it's probably at least 300,000 historic photos. Um, we've had an ongoing effort to, to digitize those and put them into a searchable image database. And we have over 30,000 images that are now searchable and accessible online through our database. So that's been one of our primary areas of focus as far as digitization. Um, that's work we can do in-house. The film digitization, especially when we're talking about 16 millimeter film and other the, the older formats, we have to outsource that. We can't do that our, ourselves. There's obviously a much more significant cost involved in that because we're having to, to pay somebody else, a vendor, to do that digitization work for us. Um, so that's something that 
we've been doing kind of piecemeal with people that request stuff or, or, or frequently request films, we've gotten them digitized. Um, that's uh, obviously something that is challenging for any small archives that doesn't have the, the capabilities to digitize film. Um, and then when we talk about, you know, digitization work, film is, is, is uh, we need larger storage space and, you know, more different, different backups and stuff. We can go into all different stuff. When we're talking about digitizing film, but um, the cost is really the biggest factor at this point with um, why we haven't digitized as much as, as, as we would like to. Not to mention staff time. It's, you know, you and me have been <laughs> all by right, ourselves exactly. here. Um, yeah, so we do it on a case by case basis. And I don't know if I've been mentioned, but, you know, we also have an extensive list of oral Ooh. histories. And so we have those transcripts, but we also have a lot of cassette tapes that we're able to digitize in house um, along with any VHS tapes. So we do have the ability to digitize those, but, you know, like film reels and things like that have to be sent out if they're requested. Yeah, I know some of our films date back you know, the mid 20th century or older. And so that just requires a, a, a level of care that we're not capable of providing um, in terms of handling it. Mark, how do you uh, manage things on there with, um, photos are pretty straightforward, you just, but in terms of film and video, like for instance, we have, in a way, one on our list of things to put in our exhibit space is um, an exhibit on the challenges of preserving um, materials because we have things on VHS, beta, uh, digital video, laser disc, glass lantern slides, um, eight, 16, 35 millimeter, I mean, on and on and on in, in a way. And then we have, equipment that goes, that allows us to look at some of this stuff, that it's, the, those uh, machines are almost really museum pieces in a way. So how, we're in the how, same boat. Everything Eben said and, and Lauren said, same thing. Uh, we have glass lantern slides. We have eight millimeter rolls and rolls of film that might just be a pronghorn at a watering hole. We don't know <laughs> until we run it. We can do some crude digitization and we can also do, like you guys said, cassette tapes, VHS and so on in-house. Older stuff. I think our oldest films go back to like 1909 or so on. We send out on an as-needed basis. It's very expensive. But I think the Bigger issue, once again, I'm a historian. So I'm coming out of that background, not the archival background. I have a curator and so on. For a historian, one of the things that's bothered me in recent years is the monetization of historic photos out there. Um, so we're trying to provide as many photos as we can. All Everything we put online is public domain. Um, and I'll give you an example. Rachel Carson was a classic example in that the, anybody wanted to use a Carson image, th there were a few out there and they were very expensive to procure, especially if you're doing like a children's book or, or something simple. Um, so we're trying to share as many historic films of wildlife conservation, as many historic images, including some public domain ones of Rachel Carson, to get out of this expense, as any author knows. You know, if you want to include photos and you have to pay for it, that's also one more uh, argument. Uh, with a publisher. And I think it's really problematic. I see a lot of our images that are in the Fish and Wildlife Service and our predecessors for sale, which doesn't make me particularly happy uh, when they really should be free. And if we can provide them online, they would be to researchers. Um, and I think it's really an issue. I think that's one of the most important things we do. The other thing we've done that's kind of fun um, is we started to use social media. So we have a FWS history, Twitter and Facebook thing, but what the most popular thing we do, it seems really hokey, is take an old image and have people write the caption for it. I mean, it is the hokiest thing in the world. It's probably not what I was trained to do as a PhD at Harvard, but it's really fun. Um, and it hopefully is an uh, entry point uh, to people getting more engaged in some of the historic image archives we have. Because if you think this is an interesting picture, um, maybe you'd like to look at some of the other ones and maybe use them in your own PowerPoint, your own books, your own articles, your own teaching. Um, so that's, uh, we're putting up short films 
too. And uh, that's been kind of fun because it's one thing to convert the films, but then what do you do with it? it? It's, you know, you can only show so many films. You might've seen some video monitors, which, which don't have the films in them yet because I'm trying to shut stuff off while we're not open. Um, but you can show a few in a museum, even a renovated museum. Maybe we show six or seven films uh, total. Um, but we have thousands. Um, so once again, social media, it's a way to share them and we can direct them back um, to the original uh, archive for them. So I, I think that's the other challenge. How do we get that stuff out there? How do we get it used? How do we save historians a few bucks uh, so they don't have to pay for all this stuff? Um, and, and we're really interested. I'm pretty positive on our mission. I think the more people know about Fish and Wildlife Service, the better. <laughs> I wouldn't necessarily say that. Um, we definitely have ghosts in our closet like everybody else. But, I, you know, I just want to get this stuff out there to as many people as possible. Um, because I think it really just helps people understand we're a relatively unknown agency compared to the Park Service and the Forest Service. Um, and, I, you know, we're trying to share it. The other one last thing I would mention, you guys reminded me with Smokey Bear. Um, we house some uh, affiliated archives too. Like we have all the archives of the Rachel Carson Council. We have the archives of the National Wildlife Federation, including a full-size like Ranger Rick <laughs> costume, which is kind of fun and a, a, a failed uh, pilot for a like 1960s Ranger Rick uh, live action show, which... <laughs> But it's probably one of their own rival, the Lassie and uh, Ranger Corey Stewart. <laughs> very good. Yeah, raccoons are, are tough. Um, but we, uh, we we do house things outside of our agency, although the bulk of our stuff is agency related. Well, Perry Meldon asks, uh, you mentioned the exhibits and stuff. He says with the archives and the, the rich material, uh, do the exhibits reflect tensions between the public and the Fish and Wildlife Service? And how do you, uh, how does the center there address these historical conflicts? We do. Um, for example, working on a new exhibit on our relations with Native Americans. Um, so on the past end, uh, people might not be aware how much uh, endangered species restoration is done on tribal lands. Everything from black-footed ferrets to uh, bison restoration and so on. Um, uh, tribal lands are huge habitat for these things and we work very well. But there's other things like a lot of refuges, just like a lot of parks were carved out of tribal lands, including some refuges like bison range that were literally carved out of a reservation and so on. So we try to represent the tensions there. If we were to do one on wolves, almost certainly uh, if we had a display on gray wolf restoration, we would acknowledge uh, the tensions with ranchers and farmers and so on. I think the bigger issue we have is we have a, a conservation kind of hall of fame thing with about a hundred conservation pioneers. Uh, and recently, as, as I'm sure all the environmental historians know and have known for a long time, a lot of these folks have skeletons in their closet. Um, it was pretty common for turn of the century conservationists um, like Hornaday and the Madison Grant and some of these folks to be racist and eugenicists and both. They kind of go together. Um, so how do you how do you deal with somebody who's like a pioneer in bison restoration when they were nearly extinct, um, but also a pretty egregious uh, racist like William Hornaday was and, and uh, John Muir recently has come under criticism, uh, even from within the Sierra Club about his views on Native Americans. This is really hard. We try to tell the whole story, um, but we're, and partially this involves retrofitting some of our interpretation and displays just because it wasn't um, as well known or as acknowledged previously. And this is a real tension that's just uh, really bubbled up significantly, I think, in the last couple of years. And we're still trying to grapple with that. You know, do you really deserve to be in a Hall of Fame if you did a lot of great work for wildlife, but you also, like Hornaday, put a, an African American, an African, excuse me, in a zoo where he died and so on? I mean, really, this is a mixed bag. And, and you know, if, if our, our kind of default has been, if they're the worst of the worst, they're not going to go in our Hall of Fame anymore, no matter what you did for wildlife, if you're a monster. <laughs> we're not going to put you in there. Um, but, you know, we have the casual racism 
basically of the turn of the century that was pretty pretty common. People really weren't um, saying nice things or considering uh, the interests of, of Native Americans or, or African Americans or other people of color. And it's, it's, a, it's a harsh reality and it's, it's difficult to interpret and uh, especially in an increasingly diverse agency um, where people are demanding that we tell the whole history. And some of the challenge is simply finding the, the written records from 100, 120 years ago. Yeah. Um, otherwise, it becomes speculation as to what they were thinking or discussing. Um, yep. But it is a challenge. It? But it is it's a challenge that we um, willingly take on, though. I mean, that's I don't want to sound flippant, but part of the what engages us as historians is un uncovering um, these things that people don't know about. And so on the one hand, it's to learn that uh, a Madison Grant, or in our, my case, some of my work on Gifford Pinchot, to learn that he was a member of the American Eugenics so Society um, was shocking, but then there's just nothing that's turned up yet in his records, uh, his diaries, the years he was involved with that organization, those diaries don't, as far as we know, they don't exist. So we can acknowledge that he was a member, we know this, but we don't know to what extent. But anyway, so it's just, it's, it's a challenge, it's welcoming. And then, the, you know, with the Forest Service itself, so many of the national for first national forests were carved out of lands that belonged to Native Americans. Yeah. So, you know, the, the agency and the historians discussing the agency are reckoning with that as we should. Um, because to date, we have to, we have to admit we've not been writing a, com uh, a full comprehensive history if we're ignoring people or, or leaving them out of that story. Um, can I put a positive spin on what you just said, Jamie, sure. in that, you know, you're spot on. One of the joys of my job is discovering these histories that haven't been found yet. Um, so I didn't know until I came to Fish and Wildlife Service about African-American Civilian Conservation Corps camps. I should have. I looked at the CCC in my dissertation, but somehow knew nothing about them. Uh, they were poorly chronicled. Um, poorly photographed, really none of the films that I've ever seen about the CCC involved these. But we had a lot of them in Fish and Wildlife Service because we had a lot of refuges in the South. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these camps, at least anecdotally, as far as I'm concerned, were stuck in really crappy areas. They were stuck in swamps like Okefenokee or swamps in Florida, rough areas. Um, and we found at least one person that served in that camp who was very old as a blacksmith, got an oral history. We have an oral history program too. Uh, and we've started to find some photographs from that period. Uh, and it's really been exciting to uncover um, this era when, when our agency really for the first time started to bring African-Americans into the agency, initially temporarily as CCC enrollees, and then later hired on um, as maintenance workers and so on, and gradually moving into the agency. So it, it had an unexpected benefit. Um, and it, it, they're just great images. At one of the refuges, they were put on houseboats because we didn't have any other housing for them. So they're houseboats in a river. Um, they built uh, a large number of refuges. There was just areas that land and they said, this is a refuge and they would build the refuge uh, housing and roads and, and visitor services. Uh, and that's been really exciting. That image uh, I showed you in the museum um, is an image we don't normally see. I see the same CCC images and it's um, always uh, uh, white Americans uh, in their 20s. And then here's a hundred African Americans doing the same conservation work. Um, that's so predominant. And so, so that or learning about Matthew Hansen and his Arctic explorations or that it is, is exciting. And it's, it's great to share that. And it is like opening a box and not knowing what's in it. So a few folks are asking about um, lecture series and virtual tours. I'll just go ahead and say that um, Mark and the Fish and Wildlife Service, they have a virtual lecture series you can access through their website. Um, and we'll have that uh, information actually, I'll 
put that in the follow-up email. You guys, tomorrow, I think it is, you'll get an email thanking you for attending or if you, uh, and so there'll be information there with, I'll put links to Mark's lecture series. Our lecture series is on our YouTube channel. There's this lecture series, Unprecedented Seasons. I'm gonna go ahead and plug that starting August 31st, we're launching a separate lecture series on non-timber forest products and the bioeconomy. And there's information on our website, foresthistory.org backslash events. That's the easiest way to find that, that information. Um, and also the videos that Mark shared with us in this talk will be part of the video that's on YouTube. It's gonna be incorporated into that. Uh, hey, Mark, Jamie. I'll encourage you to um, put your virtual tour videos up online on your site as well. Cool. Um, go ahead. Can I have a request? I, I know we're out of time and I gotta to run too. Um, but yesterday we got a very exciting artifact in, uh, a totem pole that came 20,000 miles from Washington State, basically to Washington, DC. And I have like a 30 second video that's pretty fun. I think, I think you guys will enjoy it. Um, showing why I like my job so much, but this is what I did yesterday. Uh, and if you guys would indulge me, I would love to show you this 5,000 pound, 25 foot totem pole. Uh, going up at NCTC. It was carved recently by the Lumi Nation in Washington State uh, to commemorate public lands and, and conserving habitat and wildlife. Um, and Jamie, if you're good with it, I don't want to stretch your patience or your time frame. I think it would be a fun way. I think so. I will let the folks who have asked questions, uh, we'll capture those questions and uh, coordinate that those that... Uh, FHS staff can't answer. We'll push over to Mark and we'll get answers. Cool. Um, so thank you very much for those questions. Um, I do want to go ahead and, and be, well, you know what, Mark, go ahead and show your video. And I think then, you guys uh, will like it. It's very short. Yeah, but it's no, fun. This, you were telling us about this the other day and I just yeah. can't picture something so massive. So yeah, roll film. It's very short. But you'll like it. It's time lapse we did of, of putting this thing up. Cool. Hopefully it's popped up on your screens now. It's there. That's it. It was just the tallest artifact we have in our museum and probably the hardest one <laughs> we've had bringing indoors. You outdid us. We have a, a cat face, <laughs> in, uh, which is about five or six feet tall um, that we, we recently accepted into our collection. That's a great part of forest history. And I'll just simply say, you have to come to Durham uh, to see that. We, we made a, a vi virtual video tour of our place uh, we had an accession to the cat face after we made that video. <clears throat> but um, our virtual tour is also available on our YouTube channel. Um, so Mark, thank you so much for your time and sharing everything with us today. Really appreciate Thanks, it. Jamie. Thanks to Lauren and Eben as well for chiming in. Again, you can email us your questions directly, research related at library at forest history dot org.